So we're going to thinking about the image of God or the Imago Deo this evening. And what is the image of God? What does this mean? And really, it all comes back to these questions. Who am I? Am I a whole person? What does it mean to be a whole person? What does it mean to be human? Perhaps you want to put in the chat what you think makes us human. And maybe we'll look at it as we come and go along. This word image, there are three main readings in scripture where God talks about image. In Genesis 1, 26 to 27, it says, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so they may rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, livestock, wild animals, all creatures that move along the ground. And God creates mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. And then in Genesis 5, when Adam had lived 130 years, he had a son in his own likeness, in his own image, and he named him Seth. Then after the flood, we have this comment in Genesis 9, whoever sheds human blood, by humans shall their blood be shed. For in image of God has God made mankind. And if you remember our discussion about the various documents that make up Genesis, these three verses all come from the same one, the priestly document. And yet, how can we made in God's image when actually God doesn't have an image? And D. Klein says that humankind is created not in God's image since God has no image of his own, but as God's image or rather to be God's image. Because if God is spirit, he doesn't look like me or anyone else on this meeting. So how can we be made in God's image when he is not human like us? And that is a good question. And yet we find here, don't we, that the exegesis of this chapter one of Genesis, let us. Now, I would argue perhaps this is the first committee meeting. Because actually, if you read through Genesis 1, and we will be doing that on a Tuesday night, we find that God said, God said, let there be light. God said, let there be X. And there was. And then there was day, et cetera, et cetera. But here in this verse, there is let us, which indicates that God is discussing this creation of human with the spirit and with Jesus. And we're not going to go down the avenue of what the Trinity is. But let us, and perhaps there was the first committee meeting, although it's not like most committee meetings, something actually happened out of it. But there must have been some agreement. And of course, John tells us that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. And we find animals were formed out of the ground. Yet man was formed from the ground. And the other things, God saw that it was good. But when he speaks about humanity, he sees it's very good. So we have these slight changes, and we don't have time to go into all of them tonight. But there's a difference in the way that humans are created and the animals or the birds. Or even the sun and the stars. Different. Which would indicate that we are special. We're the only ones made in God's image. And of course we have Adam created. And then Eve. And of course there's been different interpretations. Was Eve an afterthought? Was Eve just there because God couldn't find any other companion? Or was Eve part of the plan? And Meyer in her book talks about, well, the traditional interpretation of the story. And of course, the writers of the Bible were a patriarchic society, so men were more important. And they say, well, yes, 
Eve was an assistant, a subordinate, who ran as aides to a master or superior. Yet, if you look at the, the Hebrew, this word ezi, the noun helper, can refer to the opposite, namely to a superior, notably God to whom one turns for help in time of distress. And this word, this Hebrew word for help, when God says, I need to find Adam a helper. It's the same word that the Hebrew use when they say, who must I turn to in my times of trouble? My help comes from God. Our friend Charlotte von Kirschbein writes in her interpretation of this verse, the lonely individual needs a helper in order to avoid being lonely any longer, to overcome his loneliness through his own resources. God has to offer him this helper. And she speaks about a shared existence. He emerges the first time with the appearance of woman. She compliments him as his helper. Of course, uh, von Kirschbaum is writing alongside Karl Barth. So as we'll come on to, and I'm sure you'll, sure you'll be excited about this, his interpretation, it's all about relationships. It's not surprising that Charlotte here writes about this relationship to overcome this loneliness. And Gaffney talks about the mighty helper, the, the Ezer in Hebrew is to, it's difficult actually to translate into English. It refers to God, as I've said, and the divine help God renders. An English translation, really, a help is often someone who helps, doesn't it? It's, it's a lower status. But what the Hebrew is saying here isn't a lower status. God doesn't say he created man and then, well, female is an afterthought. That verse we read said he created them in his image, male and female, a joint project. And if we go back to that reading, we have these words image and likeness. Now, there's a lot of debate around this, and I'm just going to give a few thoughts around it. But the image, the selam and the likeness, dumunt, some suggest they're essentially synonymous. That indicates that human beings resemble God, but do not themselves specify the precise nature of the resemblance. And of course, theologians, probably because we've got nothing better to do, we read a lot into this word image. And is there a difference between image and likeness? Because actually, if you look to the verse about Adam, it changes around that. Seth was made in the likeness of Adam and then speaks about image afterwards. But there are some translations. If you go to the Greek, we've done the imago and the simitilido or something to that effect. Talks about, well, one common variety in the Arrhenius, the, the church father was along these lines. The imago actually means the human nature, which cannot be lost. So our imago is our God-given human character, which cannot be lost, but the likeness is lost because of the fall, because of sin. And it's only really restored through Jesus, and actually it's only really fully restored at the last days when there is the new creation outlined in Revelation. It means man's original relation to God can be lost, and since Adam has been lost, but of course is restored through Jesus. So there's different interpretation on these verses, what it means. And if you read Burkhor, who's a, a Dutch theologian, or was a Dutch theologian, he's uh, died now, he says the relation between the image of God and sin continually injects itself. And more specifically, the question of the relation between the homo creatus, the original creative being, Adam, prior to the fall, and the homo picorator, which is the man after the fall. Can the homo pictoria also be called the image of God in spite of sin, or can the term be meaningfully employed only in relation to humanity as originally created and to us after restoration of the original image through grace, which obviously comes through Jesus. So some interesting questions come here. I suppose one question is, 
does it really matter? Are we ever going to understand it? Because you can pick up several books and they all give you a different interpretation. And if in fact you get Johannesson's book, which you have to go to the British Library for, it goes through the history of the image and it's about four or five hundred pages. But what does it mean to be made in the image of God? Really, that's the crux of what we want to look at. And there are different people giving interpretations. And most of them are German or a bit of Dutch. You've got down the bottom here, we've got Gerald von Rad, who wrote his book Genesis, and he would talk about us being a representative of God here on earth. We are a representative. God has put us here to represent, as similar as a king. He has ambassadors to represent him where they place. So the British ambassador represents the government and his majesty, the king, when they are in America. If they're the American ambassador, if they're the French ambassador, they, re they represent us in France. A representative. So here we are as a representative of God on earth. Karl Barth, and I'll come on to him a bit more in, in detail, talks about this counterpart, this, this relationship, just as we have a relationship male and female, so there's a relationship between humanity and God. And God creates us for that relationship. Others talk about, well, with the external form, we are God, and it's in us. Maybe it's spiritual capacities or qualities that we have. We're spirit in us. There is something inside of us, isn't there? There's something that makes me Simon. Something that makes you you that is different from anyone else inside the spirit. And there's that like God is spirit. And then we have knowledge, righteousness, and holiness, which the Reformed tradition started to say, well, like God, we now have knowledge. We have righteousness, which obviously attained through Jesus, and holiness. Again, others talk, well, we were, God worked in creation, and so therefore we work in replica of that. And that's why we were told to look after the garden and look after the animals doing all that naming. So you've got, just to say who they are, um, Von Rad, Bart, then you've got um, Burkhoff, and then Klaus Vesterman at the end, all uh, theologians. And they pick out different things. But Karl Barth has four points. He says, well, if we want an authentic relationship, if we want to reflect what God has in us, well, there is four criteria. He says a relationship must be visible. We must be able to look each other in the eye. We must have communication, speak and hear one another. Activity, we must be able to render mutual existence and we have emotions he said we should do it gladly now of course there are lots of questions around that if we talk about ai or our avatars they don't have emotions you can ask alexa how she's feeling and she will say fine or i'm not happy today but that is just the machine speaking picking out an algorithm or picking out an option she can't experience that emotion that we have the emotion you know when Chelsea put six past Everton on Monday night emotions and this again applies to some of the stuff in the metaverse yes I can look people in the eye but who am I looking in the eye the avatar or the person behind the avatar we can communicate we active and this is what Bart says is a ultimate relationship between God and us and us and everyone else and of course we don't always do things gladly do we when we think of our work life then sometimes we have to do it because the boss says to do it or we have to do it because it's in the contract so there's different stages in this relationship but Bart talks about this this is what it means and that's what and Van Kirschbaum was talking about in her bit about man and woman that this relationship is a shared one and then just to throw in a different concept to bring us towards the end the africans are prop popularly known for their ubuntu i probably haven't pronounced it 
rightly, and I apologise for that, but I am because you are. And of course, this actually builds on Bart's idea of this relationship. The theory behind this, and Desmond Tutu was a great speaker about this in the reconciliation process in South Africa. But it's, I only exist because you do. And this actually lies back to what Bart and von Kirschbaum were saying, that we exist for each other. We exist only in relationship. I or myself, well, what good am I? Ubuntu is an African concept of personhood in which the identity of the self is understood to be formally interdependent through community. We are who we are because of our dependence, because they're joining through community. Being human through other people. We're only human because you're human. I'm only human because you're human. And at the heart of this is an understanding of identity as it emerges through relationships. This principle of interconnectedness. We are interconnected with one another. And yet Battle, when he wrote, he writes a book on this, talks about it's not through competition. And then these skills are needed for us to develop and enjoy this community, expands our horizons. And you, I think one says, that's right, I think how Coffee Shop Sunday has expanded all of our horizons, definitely expanded my horizons with my introduction to Methodism and to liturgy and to all you good people who challenge and bring us some great questions and make us think about it all. It deepens our spirituality. It's Yes, we can be Christians alone. And there's people in prison and places like that who, who are alone. But actually, how do we grow as Christians? Well, the early church, doesn't it? They met together. And we do, don't we, in Coffee Church Sunday? We meet together, which expands our spirituality. And this communal self does require practice. And the point they say to think about battle says is, who do we want to be in relation to people others think I am? Who am I? Who am I? I'm Simon. What does that mean? I could say be Simon here, but if I go in the metaverse, I might be Fred. I could go somewhere else and I might be James. Does my identity come from what I do? When I was in the, the police force, I didn't. I was seen as a police officer. And it's actually when you retire, you lose some of their identity. I'm sure those others of you have been in various occupations. You lose that identity when you retire. I used to have a warrant card. I could arrest people if they committed a crime. You can still do under certain circumstances, but I had that blanche power of arrest. Of course, things had to be right. You couldn't just pick anyone off the street. But if you had the grounds and you could do it, and you had to have less grounds as a police officer than you do as a civilian. But my identity came from that, or identity may came from our medical qualifications, or we are a chaplain. What about affiliations, our football clubs? How, how does people see us, our football clubs or our sports clubs? What about our values? Are we known by relationships? Are we known, well, you're a dad or you're a son or you're a brother or your uh, partner? Or perhaps what I hope would impress others, are we known by things like qualifications or other things that we do, our voluntary work? Do we want to be known by what we hope will impress others? But it is being about I am because you are. And then we move on. So we've looked at what it means to be human and how we're made in the image of God. But how does that move then on to this metaverse, to about us as avatars? So we're going to think about avatars and being made in the image of God. What is an avatar? Well, there are different definitions. It all goes back, in fact, to the, the Hindu religion when one of their gods came down to earth and uh, described an avatar as a visible representation of the, the god. And really, that is a visible self-representation. There's my avatar, my latest one in uh, big screen. Have different avatars or different apps, but that's my avatar. And really, it's a self-representation. That's how I represent myself. 
and we could describe it as well as a visible image of the invisible people can't see me in big screen they only see my avatar so there's a visible image of the invisible which comes to a quite an interesting conversation later on we could have around Colossians 1 15 which I'm going to talk about in the end where Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God he is and I put it in the, out there Jesus a type of avatar but an avatar Avatars are also been described as Imago Meta. That is our way we are. You can have avatars in Zoom. You can have avatars wherever you are. And some people say where they are, they are the digital twin. And there's some papers around that, about how we have a digital twi twin when we are online. I don't know, some of you may have been to see ABBA the Voyager, but they are avatars. And they are really lifelike avatars. They move as Abba used to move. They sing and the voices are from the musicians. Are they real? Well, actually, you could argue that they're not real because there's not a person sitting behind them. But the avatar, when I'm in Metaverse Church, there is. Who am I? It's a good question. Who am I? Am I Simon? Am I pastor? Am I just there floating in church? Who am I? Who do I represent? Who am I here? Am I a, a, a police officer when I'm on duty? I was on duty. When I was doing some running, I'm a runner. When I'm doing preaching, I'm a preacher. And here, who am I here? Well, I'm doing the scenes of crime in my detective work. But am I Simon? Or am I Simon the runner, Simon the officer, Simon the preacher, Simon the forensic? Who am I? Am I a different person or do I remain the same person? Or actually, are all these just visible representations of me? When I'm running and I've got my running gear on, is that my running avatar? When I go to work or used to go to work and put my police officer's uniform on, am I a police officer avatar? When I'm preaching, am I in that way of being a preacher? I'm a friend that you wouldn't recognize me, but am I me? Or is it just a figment of your imagination? Now, I'm going to show you a little clip of this works, and who is the pastor? Some of you are like, what? That's the greatest thing ever. Not to me. It's just not. I don't know. I don't like it, okay? Uh, we don't coach our kids' sports teams. I know. Some of you are like, oh, you're those parents. Yep, that's us, because we couldn't make our kids better athletes, you know, out there. Uh, we don't hang out at coffee shops. Like, if we're going to go, we're probably going to uh, go through the drive through and then we're going to go down to the lake and, and go sit along the lakefront or go sit in the couch at the uh, end of a you know, hallway in a resort. So that was church in the Metaverse, and we did a room where there was no floor, which was a bit unnerving, to be honest. But which was that one of those persons was the VR pastor. Obviously, the, the, real, the main pastor was there speaking from the screen. But who was? <coughs> who was the pastor? Would you know? That Stuart, our VR pastor at Lakeland Church. But you wouldn't recognize him. You wouldn't know he was the pastor. But he isn't incognito. Because actually, you click on his uh, avatar, then it says his name. But if you haven't got the name pastor in there, you wouldn't perhaps know. Which gets us to... The next thought really, are we not all just avatars? Who is the real me is the question. Who is the real me? Who is the real you? And there are some studies around that. Dr. Paula Gooder in this book, Body, talks about the soul is that unique core that makes a person truly human. And yet she uses this word meanness because it doesn't matter when I was 
younger, as we all were, I've changed. My body has changed. My good looks have changed. Some might say they've improved. My physique has gone up, down, and up. But I still remain me. I mean, there's something about me that is me. And we talk about the soul, the spirit, depending on which uh, theologian you want to follow. Some say there's free body, soul, and spirit. Others say, well, it's the soul and the body. But it's this mean, it's not my body that's a relationship with God, is it? It's the meanness, my soul, my inner being. However, we want to describe it. This meanness of me, Paula says, can only be fully realized in a relationship with God. As the soul describes not only the living person, but the identity beyond the grave. We believe in the new heaven and the earth. We believe that when we die, we go to be a Jesus. Well, our body stays here. And having been to post mortems, we we know it stays. And we cut bits out and put bits back. And but this the meanness still goes, disappears. We can't catch that. And people can put a new heart into people. They're, they're trying to put new brains, but what they can't do is put that meanness back into us. Martin Heidegger, he describes it as thatness, whatness, I, myself, this, this thing about us that is different. That makes us an individual. It makes us me. And, and he goes on to put, we're not going to go down this route tonight, but does in, but what does it mean to be? The mode of being is another interesting conversation and Bart and Bonhoeffer and the others all get involved about this word dolls in which just really means being we're not going to go down that road tonight Carl Bart says well the visible body what we can see represents the objective aspect of human nature and the invisible soul represents the subjected life of material organization and put it into simple terms when I am baptized the body is the vehicle for the baptism of my soul. When I do things, this body is just a vehicle for the inside. It represents me and I can change it. But the meanness still returns. Whether I have my hair long, short, it's still me. And yet when we go online, uh, Gackerberg and Bone, they talk about this hyper personal self where the internet permits the person to create their online personality in a different context from their real identity but does it because actually when i go to work my identity is around policing now it'd be nice to say well i'm the same person at work as i'm at home as at sport and we all try and say that but actually we don't when we're being a parent then our relationship is different than when we're being uh, dealing with people at work our colleagues my relationship when I deal with the dogs is perhaps different than speaking with Linda. We all play different parts. We all have these avatars. And really to bring it to an end, the sun is in the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Now, I'm not going to suggest that yeah, well, that Jesus is an avatar. Because we know Jesus is real. But actually, Jesus, after his resurrection could do things that my avatar can do my avatar depending on the app platform can walk through walls my avatar in the game if i play a game with it it, it can kill it but it just comes back to life it doesn't die i can change my my avatar if i don't want a cowboy hat and i want a red hoodie tomorrow i can have a red hoodie with a flat cap i can have what i want i can change my identity but is that no different than when we come to church or in the old days, we used to have our Sunday best. And we put on this uniform, this identity to match what is expected at the location. Now, we could argue that that's changed. But what we do know about image is that we only really become a true image of God through Jesus. Because that's what we, as Trevor often says, attain to be like. The image of God is really seen in Jesus. And we reach our full potential through Jesus. So that's just a little introduction. I've only given you a light, slight introduction to image and 
avatars and hopefully now we can have some conversation around that.